Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Today we will begin describing sensitivity-based methods for estimating upper subcritical limits, and we'll start by describing what sensitivity coefficients are and how we calculate them. Before we dive into sensitivity coefficients, it's helpful to brush up on operator notation, adjoint theory, and the first order perturbation equation. It's not necessary to be an expert in these areas for the purposes of this course, but it's helpful in case you want to understand the theory behind these sensitivity coefficients. I've prepared lectures on these topics for my graduate reactor kinetics course, and the links to these lectures are given in this video's description. So what are sensitivity coefficients? Sensitivity coefficients are essentially relative derivatives that describe how uncertainty or perturbations in some parameter, sigma, will affect some response, r. In criticality safety applications, these uncertain input parameters could be neutron cross-sections, fission spectrum distributions, angular scattering kinematics data, or any other nuclear data that is fed into a Monte Carlo criticality safety simulation. In general, we care about how the nuclear data uncertainty affects eigenvalue responses, but we can also compute sensitivity coefficients for reaction rate-based responses, neutron fluxes, or several other quantities. So how can we compute these sensitivity coefficients? Well, let's start by saying how we can't compute these sensitivities. We can compute individual sensitivity coefficients through brute force. That is, we can estimate the approximate sensitivity of K effective to some specific cross-section by computing K effective under normal, nominal conditions, and with some slight perturbation to sigma. However, this approach isn't quite as easy as it sounds. We must introduce a perturbation that's large enough so that the delta R is significantly larger than our simulation's stochastic uncertainty, but if our perturbation is too large, then we'll introduce some higher order nonlinear behavior, making our sensitivity coefficients no longer just the first derivative. To make things even more complicated, this approach quickly runs face first into the curse of dimensionality when applied to criticality safety problems. In the next few lectures, we'll discuss how these sensitivity-based USL methods require very high-resolution sensitivity coefficients, which means that computing direct perturbation sensitivity coefficients for a reasonably complex nuclear criticality safety problem will be enormously time-consuming. This kind of problem might require computing sensitivity coefficients for a system with 150 unique materials, each possibly having around 10 isotopes per material, with each isotope requiring sensitivity coefficients for about 12 reactions, such as fission, elastic scatter, inelastic scatter, radiative capture, and alpha reactions, N2N reactions, NP reactions, etc. If we need to estimate these sensitivities across 250 energy groups, which is the normal number for some codes, then that means that we need to compute these sensitivities for 4.5 million uncertain variables. If we can compute these sensitivity coefficients for each of these variables using only one direct perturbation, then that's a minimum of 4.5 million calculations. But in reality, that's actually pretty optimistic. Usually we need multiple perturbations per variable to properly identify linear behavior. And as I mentioned before, this assumes that our perturbations are sized perfectly so that they produce a linear perturbation that is statistically significant compared to stochastic uncertainty. Because we need high-resolution sensitivity coefficients, and because it's not feasible to estimate them using direct perturbation, sensitivity analysis methods in nuclear criticality safety will generally use adjoint-based approaches to estimate these sensitivity coefficients. Computing these adjoints isn't easy, and advancements in sensitivity codes generally provide more and more efficient means for estimating these adjoint fluxes. We'll spend more time discussing just how these methods work in a few minutes, and just how they estimate adjoints, but first, let's review a brief history of these sensitivity methods. The FORS code system was one of the first sensitivity analysis codes, and it was developed in 1978 by Oak Ridge National Laboratory to quantify uncertainty in pressure vessel fluence, which is one of the lifetime limiting parameters for light water reactors. Oak Ridge lovingly called this code FORS, which stands for the F Oak Ridge Sensitivity Suite. Oops, it sounds like there is a blip in my video's audio there. If you couldn't tell, that F stands for FANTASTIC. Around the time FORS was released, 
a scientist by the name of Mark Williams at Oak Ridge developed another way for estimating adjoints. Dr. Williams' method, which he dubbed contributon theory, not contribution theory, but contributon theory, provides the theoretical framework for estimating adjoint fluxes by simulating secondary particles in an imaginary universe in parallel with events in the main Monte Carlo simulation. The code would track what these secondary particles did and how many fissions they induced, which allowed the code to estimate the importance of the event that spawned these secondary particles. The contributon method was eventually implemented in a Monte Carlo code, but advancements by Reardon in 1999 provided a more straightforward way of estimating adjoints. Reardon's multi-group tsunami code provided the first means for estimating sensitivity coefficients in 3D Monte Carlo simulations, and tsunami really opened the door for sensitivity analysis in the criticality safety community. Reardon's tsunami method computed the flux as a function of space, energy, and direction in a Kino Monte Carlo simulation, and then it transposed the scattering and fission kinematics data to trick Kino into performing an adjoint Monte Carlo simulation, where it then tallied the flux, which is now the adjoint flux, as a function of space, energy, and direction. Tsunami then folds these two fluxes together, according to the first order perturbation equation, to estimate eigenvalue sensitivity coefficients. The Tsunami code launched a decade of work for sensitivity based validation in criticality safety applications, and Reardon and other folks at Oak Ridge developed several of these sensitivity based code validation methods that we'll discuss in the following lectures. Work on sensitivity coefficients continued in 2009 in the MCMP code where Kodrowski, a PhD student at Wisconsin, and Brown developed the first method for estimating adjoint weighted eigenvalue sensitivity coefficients in a continuous energy Monte Carlo code. Reardon's multigroup tsunami approach wouldn't work in continuous energy Monte Carlo because continuous energy scattering kinematics data could not be easily transposed. But Kodrowski's iterated fission probability method, which was based on work by Hurwitz from 1948, provided an alternative, and to be honest, a very elegant approach for estimating adjoint weighted tallies. The Oak Ridge Tsunami Code also moved into the continuous energy realm in 2012, when a very smart and very handsome graduate student from Michigan, by the name of Perfetti, developed the clutch method. We'll discuss clutch in more detail in a few minutes, but the short story is that it provided a new take on contributon theory that allowed codes to estimate the importance of events without simulating any secondary particles. This new approach provided a vast runtime improvement over the original contributon theory approach, which could require simulating more than 300 secondary particles for each regular particle. Clutch also provided some significant runtime and memory improvements compared to the iterated fission probability, or IFP, method. The downside to Clutch is that it's slightly more difficult to use than the other methods, but we'll discuss this all in a few minutes. Next, in 2013, Perfetti combined the Clutch and IFP methods into the GearMC method, which provided the first means for estimating sensitivity coefficients for reaction rate ratios in continuous energy Monte Carlo simulations. This new method opened the door for sensitivity analysis to be applied to non-criticality safety fields, such as reactor physics or multi-physics, and sensitivity developments have continued in these areas in recent years. In 2015, Alfiero, a postdoc at Berkeley, developed eigenvalue and reaction rate sensitivity methods in the Serpent Monte Carlo code, which has the added challenge of using Woodcock tracking. Alfiero also developed a method for estimating the sensitivity of bilinear ratios, which includes all sorts of adjoint weighted kinetics properties. In 2018, Burke, a graduate student at Michigan working with Brian Kodrowski and Forrest Brown, developed an approach for approximating the sensitivity of eigenvalue responses to uncertainty in boundary or system dimensions. And in 2021, Murphy, a graduate student at UNM, and Perfetti developed an approach for estimating sensitivity coefficients for time-dependent depletion responses in Monte Carlo simulations. The exciting field of sensitivity analysis continues to grow to this day. So now that you've suffered this history lesson on sensitivity analysis, 
How do we estimate these sensitivity coefficients? Eigenvalue sensitivity coefficients are generally estimated using the first order perturbation equation. And when you translate this equation from math speak into a Monte Carlo code, it turns out that we need to estimate reaction rates and weight them by estimates for the adjoint flux for that neutron, which describes just how important that neutron is and how much it contributes to a system's eigenvalue. Monte Carlo codes have no problem computing reaction rates, and they can compute material, isotope, reaction, and energy-dependent reaction rates at a resolution that's needed to obtain high-resolution sensitivity coefficients. The trick with these codes is finding some way of estimating the proper adjoint flux by which to weight these reaction rate tallies. The premise of the iterated fission probability method is that the importance of a single particle traveling in some region of phase space is directly proportional to the population of neutrons that it creates many generations after this particle ceases to be. This originating particle is known as the progenitor, and the number of progeny, or descendants, that it creates is known as its asymptotic population. In practice, we can't afford to wait an infinite number of generations to know a particle's importance, and so we wait for a finite number of latent generations, after which the progenitor's asymptotic population is approximately equal to its true asymptotic population. The reaction rates needed in the first order perturbation equation are tallied by the progenitor particle, and the asymptotic population provides an estimate for the importance of these tallies. Thus, we have exactly what we need to estimate sensitivity coefficients. The downside to the iterated fission probability method is that we must store the progenitor's reaction rate tallies for the latent generations until we reach its asymptotic generation. The number of latent generations necessary is usually between 5 and 10, but the MCMP code assumes 20 latent generations, which is a fairly conservative number. The memory footprint for the progenitor tallies can reach as much as 1 megabyte per progenitor particle, and this memory footprint can quickly become unwieldy if you're simulating many thousands of particles per generation. We'll discuss the IFP method's memory footprint in more detail when we discuss how the clutch method alleviates these memory requirements. So how do we perform IFP sensitivity calculations? The criticality safety community tends to use either the Kino or MCMP Monte Carlo codes for its safety analyses, and both codes allow for IFP sensitivity coefficient calculations. If you're using Kino, then you can use the CE Tsunami 3D code to estimate IFP sensitivity coefficients. The MCMP code provided the first IFP capability, but I also implemented IFP into Tsunami when I developed the clutch method in Tsunami. To use Tsunami for IFP calculations, the easiest option is to start with a working Kino input and to modify several input parameters. I'll assume that you already know how to use Kino and that you already have a working Kino input. Starting with this input, you'll first want to change the sequence name to either Tsunami 3D K5 or Tsunami 3D K6, depending on if your input is a Kino 5 or Kino 6 input. Next, you'll need to add some IFP input parameters to scale's read parameters block. CET equals 2 tells Tsunami to perform an IFP simulation, and CFP equals X tells Tsunami to perform the IFP calculation using X latent generations. The default for this number of latent generations is 5, but some problems may require 10 or even 20 latent generations. The Tsunami code's memory footprint scales linearly with the number of latent generations, so it's usually best to aim for a number of latent generations that is sufficient, but also to avoid overkill. I usually start with a CFP equal to 10, and then increase it if I find that my sensitivity coefficients are not accurate. Some other useful Kino Tsunami input parameters include NPG, which is the number of particles per generation, NSK, which is the number of skip generations, and gen, which is the total number of inactive plus active generations. The memory footprint of the Tsunami IFP implementation scales linearly according to CFP times NPG, and so you'll want to avoid making NPG obnoxiously large 
in these simulations. An NPG of 10,000 and a CFP of 10 usually produces a reasonable memory footprint, and it samples enough histories per generation to avoid those pesky Monte Carlo undersampling biases. From here you can run your code, And then you can right click on the input name and open the text output file. In this file, you'll find all sorts of interesting information about your simulation, and you'll also find the sensitivity coefficients for each material, isotope, and reaction in your problem. You'll also find some uncertainty information where Tsunami combines these sensitivity coefficients with the cross-section covariance data to show how much uncertainty each piece of nuclear data introduces on our system's eigenvalue. Moving on to MCMP, the LAUR17-2567 document describes how to perform IFP calculations in MCMP. And let's summarize this document. The KOPS block size equal option allows us to specify the number of latent generations for the IFP calculation. And the K code block allows us to specify MCMP's equivalents to NPG, NSK, and GEN. It's worth noting that the MCMP IFP implementation is more memory efficient than Tsunami's implementation. MCMP only creates progenitor chains one generation at a time while Tsunami creates new progenitor chains every single generation. And so, MCMP's IFP memory requirements will be less cumbersome than Tsunami's, but MCMP's calculations will also be less efficient. To simulate the same number of progenitors, and to get roughly the same amount of uncertainty in your sensitivity tallies, MCMP simulations will have to run x times as many generations as a Tsunami simulation, where x is the number of latent generations. These are things to keep in mind when you use these methods so that your calculation can produce a manageable memory footprint and obtain sensitivity coefficient estimates with a reasonable degree of accuracy. While Tsunami automatically estimates sensitivity coefficients for every single isotope and reaction and material in the problem, MCMP's case send card allows the user to specify for which reactions the user tallies eigenvalue sensitivity coefficients. The XS card denotes that we want to tally the sensitivity of eigenvalue estimates to different reaction rates, and the RXN equals and ERG equals cards allow us to specify for which reactions we want sensitivity coefficients and what energy groups we use for our sensitivity tallies. In the next lecture, we'll discuss how we can do magical things by combining our sensitivity coefficients with cross-section covariance data, and when we do this, We'll need to make sure that our sensitivities use the same energy group structure as our covariance data, and that they're estimated for every single isotope and reaction in our system. The PRDMPJ card prevents MCMP from overloading our outputs with extra information, and that's all we need for MCMP to estimate eigenvalue sensitivity coefficients for some input. Now the time has come for us to discuss the clutch method which uses contributon theory to estimate eigenvalue sensitivity coefficients with more efficiency and with lower memory requirements than the IFP method. Before we discuss clutch, let's take a brief interlude to review delta functions, which are one of the mythical beasts of the mathematical world. Let's assume that we have a step function, which assumes a value of h over some range, and then steps down to zero at some value of x. If our step function steps down at x0 equals 1 over h, then it will have an overall area of 1. If we change the height and duration of this step function, we can preserve its area by setting each alternative value of x0 to always equal 1 over h. Delta functions are a version of this step function where we take the limit as x0 approaches 0. This creates a function with several interesting properties. The delta function has a value of 0 everywhere, except at x equals 0, where it has an infinite magnitude. 
Also, the integral of the delta function equals zero unless our integral encompasses x equals zero, in which case the integral of the delta function is again equal to one. If we have a delta function that's a function of x minus x naught, then we can shift the location of our delta from being centered at x equals zero to being centered around any x naught. Perhaps most interesting is what happens when we take the integral of a delta function times some other function, f of x. If our integral doesn't encompass x naught, then this integral again equals zero. But if it does encompass x naught, then this integral equals f of x evaluated at x equals x naught. So how do clutch and contributon theory use delta functions? Well, consider a problem where we have a source of neutrons that equals our fission source. Any kind of criticality safety simulation would fall into this category. If we multiply both sides of this equation by the adjoint flux and then integrate over all phase space, then we arrive at this expression. Now, let's assume that our source of neutrons is actually just one single neutron traveling in phase space tau equals tau sub s. In this case, q is actually equal to a delta function times the source strength q sub s, which we'll assume equals one since we only have one particle. From here, we can simplify our inner product from earlier to develop an expression for the adjoint value of a neutron traveling in some phase space tau sub s, which ends up equaling this Green's function containing the g and f star functions. g describes the number of fission neutrons created at position r by the particle originating in the tau sub s phase space, while f star of r describes the average importance of fission neutrons born at location r. So it seems like this means that we need to know the importance of fission neutrons to estimate the importance of other neutrons. How can that work? How can we compute the importance of neutrons if we need to know the importance of neutrons to do so? Clutch solves this dilemma by using the IFP method to estimate F star during the inactive or skipped generations, and then by storing it on a spatial grid for the clutch calculations to use. This approach seems kind of complicated, why not just use the IFP method to estimate sensitivity coefficients from the start? The answer is memory footprint. If we were to use the IFP method to estimate sensitivity coefficients for a mildly complicated criticality safety problem, then again we might need to compute sensitivity coefficients for 150 materials, for 10 isotopes per material, for 12 reactions per isotope, and then for 250 energy groups per reaction. These tallies would consume 8 bytes of memory per double variable, and we would have to store them for perhaps 10,000 particles per generation for perhaps 20 generations until the progenitors produce their asymptotic populations. This would create a whopping 7,200 gigabyte memory footprint, and this is far from the most complicated problem that we can imagine. If we instead use the IFP method to compute F star, then each progenitor would only need to store one piece of information, the index of the grid mesh where the progenitor was born. That's it. We'd still need to store this data for each of the 10,000 particles per generation, and for possibly 20 latent generations, but even this would only produce a 1.6 megabyte memory footprint. So by using the IFP method to compute F star instead of sensitivity coefficients directly, we reduce the IFP method's memory footprint to something that's within the noise of the simulation, yet we still retain the accuracy of standard IFP sensitivity coefficient calculations. The downside to clutch is that we need to compute and converge F star. Doing so involves knowing how finely resolved the F star mesh grid needs to be, and how well converged F star needs to be to yield accurate sensitivity coefficient estimates. Clutch has been implemented in several Monte Carlo codes, and let's discuss how we can prepare clutch inputs using the tsunami code. Just like with the IFP method, we start by changing the sequence name from a regular keynote input from CSAS 5 or 6 to tsunami 3 dk 5 or 6. Next, we set the CET parameter to equal 1, which tells tsunami that it's going to do a clutch calculation. Our CFP parameter once again represents the number of latent generations for our IFP calculation, but this time IFP is being used to estimate F star. 
In general, we want to use about the same number of latent generations as we would for a regular IFP sensitivity calculation, which is usually, again, between 5 and 10. Lastly, we set the CGD parameter to some arbitrary number, representing the grid geometry number of our F star mesh. We specify this F star grid geometry in the grid geometry input card, and I prefer using the X linear, Y linear, and Z linear parameters to specify this mesh. With these parameters, we first specify the number of meshes that we want in that particular dimension, and then we specify the minimum and maximum values of X, Y, or Z for that mesh's dimension. There are several additional options for specifying non-uniform grid intervals, if that's what you want to do, but I personally prefer having uniform mesh intervals. The F star mesh will need to encompass all fissile regions in the problem, and its mesh intervals generally need to be around 1 to 2 centimeters wide in each dimension. Using mesh intervals that are too large will prevent the code from accurately capturing the space-dependent behavior of F star, while mesh intervals that are too small will result in poorly converged F star estimates since we'll have on average fewer progenitor chains born in each mesh cell. F star will be computed during the inactive generations, and sometimes we actually need to increase the number of inactive generations to allow F star to converge. While testing the clutch method, we found that generally we need to simulate between 0.1 and 20 inactive histories per mesh interval to adequately converge F star. To be honest, this is actually way fewer particles than I expected, and I was quite surprised to see that Clutch can compute accurate eigenvalue sensitivity coefficient estimates with fairly coarse F star meshes. From here we can run the Clutch input, Examine the output. And plot the sensitivity coefficients from the SDF sensitivity data file. This concludes our lecture on methods for estimating eigenvalue sensitivity coefficients in Monte Carlo criticality safety simulations. This is a fairly rapidly growing field where I'm actively conducting research, and I encourage you to comment or to reach out to me via email if you're interested in learning more about these methods or this research area. In the following lecture, we'll use these sensitivity coefficients to quantify the impact of nuclear data uncertainty in criticality safety simulations, and to estimate the similarity of different systems.